Uh, well, I'll start by asking about the, the opening line. Right. Because uh, when, I, when I saw it, as soon as he said the opening line, <clears throat> the entire audience burst into laughter and then stopped abruptly and then laughed again at their own reaction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that the kind of thing you're, you're hoping for, hoping it, to achieve? Yeah, I mean, they all, almost start to choke on the laughter, I guess, in the opening scene. I, I think, I, you know, as the priest says, it's, that's certainly a startling opening line. Um, yeah, you're trying to grab people by the throat right at the beginning of the movie. Um, you know, I like doing pre-credit sequences. I like having, grabbing people as early as you can, you know. I don't understand those movies. You know where they start? and they, It's like there's aerial shots of a, of New York and you get all the credits and stuff like that. It's like, what's the point of all that? I guess just so people can settle down in their seats with their popcorn. There's no other point to it. Why not just tell the story straight away? So I'm always trying to do that immediately, grab people uh, from the very beginning. And I knew once I'd written that scene, yeah, it's going to go up because the tendency is, OK, it's by the right director of the guards that this, this will be funny. And they, they start to laugh and then they start to, you know, choke on it, really. And then laugh again later on. So, yeah, you, it's, it's a way of uh, trying to be original and trying to wrong foot an audience right from the start of the movie. I mean, you handle themes like child abuse and, and religion and death all in, in what is a, it's still effectively a dark comedy. Yeah. Was, was it, I mean, you do strike a perfect balance, but was it quite a challenge when writing to ensure that both sides were served quite well? Not in, not in the writing of it. it. That would be more where in the post-production when it comes to the editing. I don't usually think, you know, everyone, critics talk about tone or producers talk about tone, you know, is it, is it tonally correct or whatever. When I'm writing, I'm just trying to sort of amuse myself and tell a good story. So it's only when we get into the editing that I'd start saying, OK, we've had that's two bleak scenes in a row. Maybe we should shift it, you know, put a funny scene in between or stuff like that. And the, the script is, it does have a kind of episodic feel. So it, the guard was more plot driven. This one, I could shift a few scenes around here and there, move one from later on, bring it in earlier. So it was easy to do that. And so I kind of tried to work out the tone at that point. No, I, I, when I'm writing, I try not to over-intellectualise what I'm actually writing. Because, I mean, the film does obsess uh, over death. Yeah. And I was wondering if um, if the process of writing was quite comforting to you. Because as an audience member, I actually found it quite a... I mean, the, the priest's acceptance of his own sort of fate is very... It's quite enlightening, I suppose. Yeah, I know. It's, you, I mean, you're dealing... You're, you're basically creating characters who are coming out with these sorts of dilemmas, I suppose, or philosophical ideas... And in a way, it's only when I read it back that I start thinking about a lot of that stuff myself. It kind of comes out subconsciously. But obviously, once if you're creating a character who is there or was supposed to be there to provide solace to a community, in, whether people are sick, they're dying, you're, obviously the issues of life and death are going to become apparent anyway you know it's not like you're a plumber you're going around fixing people's sinks you know you're trying to fix people's minds or, or, or they were supposed to so you're right those sort of narrative elements are going to come out of the character really you know so it's it so it's not preconceived it's like where what would the character do next well he'd go and talk to a woman who's being adulterous or whatever he'd go and talk to an old man who's feeling suicidal that's what he would do and that helps you create the characters as you go along yeah. And of course, the priest knows who it was in the confessions yeah. box and the audience don't, which yeah. is a sort of subversion of sorts because usually it's the audience in that driving seat and we know what the characters sometimes Yeah, doing. yeah. Um, I was just wondering about the thought process behind, behind that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're deliberately doing it the other way around. So, you, yeah, so he knows, the, our lead character knows, and we don't. It was tricky because, you know, people's voices are very specific. So that was a tricky thing when I got to the post because... The person who it turns out to be, we do a sleight of hand with the voice. So that was a tricky sort of technical element to it. Um, what, what's interesting, I think, with the people who've seen the film is, although it has that sort of thriller narrative or the sense of impending doom, people start to get absorbed in the other in characters and the th things that are happening to them. And, it, and sort of the thriller aspect only comes in every now and again. And it's only really when it gets to the third act, it builds back up again. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was a tricky, it was a tricky approach to do that. But I thought if we got away with it, it would be original. Because, I mean, there is a kind of who done it that kind of... Who's going to do it. Who's going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Kind of thing. running through this. Was it quite fun playing with the audience's perceptions and throwing in a few red herrings? Yeah, and, because, and also when I was writing it, because when I started writing it, I, I was going to create the characters and I was only going to decide in the last 30, 30 pages who it actually was. I, had, I didn't decide myself who it was until I'd written two thirds of it. So I'm trying to create anyone, 
<laughs> these people are all so sinister. It could be any of them, yeah. you know. So you're doing that all the way through, and then, then um, I chose the, the one I chose at the end. Um, I went back and forth. I, had, I mean, when people see the film, they'll see that there, there are an awful lot of possible suspects. Yeah. And uh, Gleason is is absolutely incredible in the role. He's so affable. And he's got such a kind of graceful screen presence. Yet if he needs to be brutal, you yeah. get the sense that he can, can be. It must make your job so much easier when you're when you're working alongside people like that. I think yeah, what's interesting, I think about the performance about Brendan. He has, he has that relaxed, affable manner. But like when he blows his top, you know, and the the character uh, gets drunk and then has a terrible hangover and gets into a fight, you can actually imagine him getting into a fight in a pub as well. So it, it's that sort of poet brawler aspect I think he has, you know, in his performance really. So he he has that sort of weight. You believe both sides. I think that's there's the, he has an authority I think for the audience. So yeah, it's great. I mean, so we've done two films together. Hopefully we'll f finish off the trilogy. So just quickly, what is next? Is there a? It's a film else? about an abusive paraplegic who tries to solve the murder of one of his friends. Another comedy. Another dark comedy. Yeah, yeah. Cool. It, it, it will have a. Well, I shouldn't give away. It will have a, a hopeful ending, I think. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today.